ever heard of Captain Adolphus Margery? Neither had I, till I noticed Captain Margery's murder in Rangoon dominating the Times Index for 1875. One year later, London society was agog at the coming of an unprecedented foreign diplomat. For the first time ever, the Emperor of China condescended to send an imperial envoy to the land of the despised foreign devils. Why? He came to prevent a war between China and England, which the Chinese could hardly hope to win. He came to confirm the minor detail that any British traders who wanted might travel in the almost impassably hilly opium-growing territory on the borders of Yunnan province and Burma. But first and foremost, he came to bring an official declaration of the celestial imperial displeasure at Captain Margery's murder the previous year. Benjamin Disraeli was Prime Minister at the time. Disraeli was very proud of the Abyssinian War, an expensive punitive expedition avenging five British subjects who had been kidnapped in Addis Ababa, from which Britain gained no money, no increased trade and no new colony or sphere of influence. This made it, Disraeli believed, the first purely moral war in history. So although the King of Burma was amazed at all the fuss made over one man's life, the Emperor of China was very wise to react sympathetically to Britain's indignation about the so-called Yunnan outrage. Captain Margery was one of the attractive junior figures in the Victorian Empire. When he left the army and joined the consular service, he was happy to find himself posted to China and set about the difficult task of mastering the language. He was fascinated by the country and its people, and although his attitudes were inevitably somewhat patronising, he was far from despising Orientals simply for being Oriental. He was delighted when a special assignment in December 1874 gave him the opportunity to leave the all-too-familiar treaty ports and see something of the unknown interior. That year saw a determined effort by the British imperial powers to clear up the little matter of their exclusion from the China-Burma border. The Emperor of China and the King of Burma had agreed that their subjects should have an absolute monopoly of trade between the two countries. The British, with interests in Hong Kong and Shanghai as well as India, wanted to establish their traders' right to move between Rangoon and Canton if they wished. With this in mind, arrangements were made with the Oriental courts for Colonel Horace Brown to lead a small detachment of 50 Sikhs between Rangoon and Pekin. He and his staff would map the routes, a naturalist would accompany them to make botanical observations, and trade should follow the flag. The Emperor of China and the King of Burma gave their consent. Brown made his start from Burma. He had a tricky little matter of protocol to face first. Burmese court etiquette demanded that everyone should remove their shoes in the presence of the king. Brown had no objection. His superiors were deeply shocked when they learned that a senior British officer had let foreigners see his socks. He was not actually reprimanded, but it was made clear that it had better not happen again. Fortunately, one royal audience had granted Brown all he needed. But the diplomatic service decided he must be given diplomatic support. Margery was sent from Shanghai to join up with Brown and lead him through the even more complex quagmire of Chinese protocol, always insisting that the Chinese defer to a British sense of propriety, of course. Marguerite was accompanied by a cook, four servants, and his secretary, a large Christian Chinaman called Goggles, for his huge window-like brass-bound dark green spectacles, which struck everyone from Marguerite down as richly comic. Although Marguerite also valued Goggles' loyalty and services very highly. Actually, Marguerite himself attracted attention on his journey, by something that struck the Chinese as very funny in an Englishman, and that was perhaps ill-judged in the light of Brown's problems. He took off his boots, socks and gaiters to wade into the water when duck shooting. 
and then he walked through market towns barefoot, carrying his boots. He kept a fine journal of his travels, noticing everything, the poverty of the village peasants, the ramshackle nature of the Mandarin's administration, and its contrast with their touchy dignity and elaborate ceremonies of state. But he made his way safely to the Burmese hill country and joined Brown at Barmo. Brown had run into a new imbroglio. His passport from the king directed him by a northerly route from Barmo to Talifu, but his deputy, Mr Elias, had engaged Kakian tribesmen in Barmo as porters and worked out with them a slightly longer but less hilly route south. As they started on this route, the Kakians became disorderly. They began stealing from the stores and arguing that they wanted to go home. The simple British view was that all Kakians were dirty thieves, so what could you expect? But it seems likely that they were actually objecting to the British disregard for the royal directive to proceed north. Then, to the troubled camp came word that Chinese soldiers had moved into the city of Momain, and a warm reception was being planned for the British. Margery said this was all nonsense. He had come through Momain five days earlier, and was well received by the Mandarin and the townsfolk. He confidently offered to go ahead and see that everything was all right. Now, Momain was not itself a very grand city. It struck untravelled Europeans as just a dirty village. Still smaller and dirtier was the town of Manwine, which Marguerite reached after a couple of days' march. His reception here was not as good as it had been on the way out, but he was recognised and treated with courtesy. There were indeed some detachments of the Chinese army loafing around, but they seemed friendly. Marguerite was known to be interested in all things Chinese, and the expedition's botanist had come with him so it seemed merely courteous when some of the Chinese soldiers offered to show him some unusual hot springs near the city. Marguerite willingly agreed to accompany them and went outside the city walls to collect his pony. As he was mounting, one of the Chinese attacked him from behind and felled him to the ground. Then the dozen or so Chinese soldiers all thrust their lances into him. They cut off his head and stuck it on a tree. They chopped his body into pieces and threw them into a river. And they went back into the city. Marguerite's servants had heard of the attack on their master and took refuge in a Buddhist temple. The soldiers disregarded the sanctuary, marched in, and to the horror of the priests, massacred them all. Only the cook escaped. The botanist had escaped too having had the good fortune to be wandering in the woods looking for specimens at the time of the incident. Then the heads of the servants were mounted on spikes on the city wall as a threat to the advancing force of Colonel Brown. History doesn't relate whether the secretary's famous green glasses were still on his nose. When the Chinese army detachments marched on Brown's men, the Sikhs held them firmly at bay with their sniders, while the despised Kakien tribesmen crept round and fired the forest behind the Chinese. It was a complete military success for the British, but it led to fearful diplomatic complications. The Chinese sent a very junior civil servant to investigate the incident and the murder. The British protested that someone more senior should have gone, and hastily knighted Mr Wade, their own representative to the Imperial Court. The Chinese pointed out that the commander of the army detachment had been fired and humiliated. The British scarcely concealed their belief that this was for losing the battle, not for starting it. The Chinese executed the twelve soldiers who had killed Marguerite. The British howled for the heads of their officers and the governor of Yunnan province. It was pretty obvious that the king of Burma had colluded with the Chinese in the attempt to keep the foreign devils out of the border country but it could never be brought home to him, as no Englishman could go into an audience. They were now strictly ordered never to take off their shoes. And so the Chinese distracted attention by sending their envoy. An exotic visitor to London made everything all right. Poor Captain Marguerite, practically lost in the mists of time, 
yet his savage murder so nearly precipitated a really major imperial war which would have put him in all the history books along with Captain Jenkins' ear. <laughs>